Up from the depths, 90 stories tall, Akira Kafube thinks it's stupid, it's Godzilla! <laughs> the return of Godzilla! And today we'll be talking about this movie along with its American version um, with my special guest slash co-host slash smarter than all of you and me together, Patrick Galvin. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing good, Rev. How you doing? I'm doing okay. So this is the serious podcast talking about Return of Godzilla and Godzilla 1985. We'll be doing the silly stuff elsewhere. So Return of Godzilla. Um, as you were like mentioning before we started filming, this movie ha is very significant to the Godzilla franchise, even knowing that it's often treated as like a very minor footnote compared to the more mem I don't want to say memorable, but definitely the more fan wanky um, um, enjoy enjoyment that the um, following films would give. It's mm -hmm. like yeah, especially considering that Godzilla vs. Biollante is considered like one of the all-time great films of the Godzilla franchise. But no, there's a lot of interesting things to say about this film, especially since I just spent most of today revisiting and marathoning. Um, as much Return of Godzilla material as I could. I even read books while I was watching the movie. So, <laughs> so it was sort of a crash course. But this is definitely a movie that I have to say is kind of my, maybe my sixth, if not seventh, Godzilla movie I ever saw as a little kid. Because, mm -hmm. of course, as many of you might know, my introduction to Godzilla was the Godzilla New Year's Day marathon back in 1990 on my local channel, uh, Channel 13, I think. Um, but yeah, that was very interesting because it was all the UPA Godzilla movies along with Rodan and um, War of the Gargantuas. But it's like, oh, I gotta see more Godzilla movies because I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm bemused by this plucky little giant lizard monster, this giant dinosaur who goes around destroying cities and whatnot and fights other monsters. So the only Godzilla material that was readily available in like the mom and pop video stores of the day was, of course, Godzilla 1985, the American version of Return of Godzilla. But Patrick, before we continue, 
I don't think we ever really heard how you got into the Godzilla franchise and what's your memories of Return of Godzilla or Godzilla 1985. I grew up um, in a home and with friends who had zero interest whatsoever in Kaiju Ega. Consequently, I had no exposure to it growing up for the longest time. Um, I'd heard the name Godzilla multiple times, but I'd, I'd always assumed that Godzilla was you know a pop culture name like the Boogeyman, just some kind of generic name applied to hypothetical situations. Had no idea that it was you know part of a actual franchise or any kind of media, actual media of any of any sort. And the first Godzilla anything I ever saw was the not so beloved uh, 19, 1998 Roland Emmerich TriStar Godzilla. Um, and when I saw that film, I just assumed that TriStar had just taken that generic, what I thought was a generic pop culture name, and made a film out of it. And so I saw that. Uh, two years later, I hear about this film called Godzilla 2000. And my parents and I, all we all thought that it was going to be a sequel to the TriStar Godzilla. So went to the theater to go expecting to see Matthew Broderick versus Godzilla again. And... Uh, Imagine my surprise when the first discovering within a matter of minutes that it was a Japanese film dubbed in English and that Godzilla was portrayed not using, you know, animatronics and CGI, but through, you know, submation. I also imagine my surprise at how drastically different this Godzilla was from the TriStar Godzilla. And um, I, but needless to say, I was immediately enamored with uh, what I saw. Like, oh, this Godzilla is not quote unquote realistic, but he's more interesting. Uh, at first, I thought Godzilla 2000 was just Japan's take on what TriStar had done until that same, uh, I think it was that same year that I caught a double feature of Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah and Godzilla vs. Mothra 1992 on the Sci-Fi channel. And I saw these things came, came out in the early 90s, so they predated the TriStar Godzilla. And I realized, oh, hey, you know, the Japanese Godzilla came first. And uh, it's just been a big uh, snowballing effect uh, from there. As for uh, the film we're talking about today, um, like most people in the United States, I saw the uh, New World re-edit, uh, Godzilla 1985, first. Um, I eventually, as I was as I was growing up, uh, had a friend who moved to my neighborhood who was also a fan of this, of this stuff, and he would loan me his VHS tapes of these films, and he loaned me Godzilla 1985. And so that was how I first saw the film. And uh, as the internet started to develop, you know, in the early 2000s a little more, I found out that there was a, uh, that Godzilla 1985 was not only, not only was it dub, but it was a heavily re-edited version of what Toho had released in the previous year, 1984. So I knew about that by reputation for a while until I eventually saw a, a fan subtitled version of the Japanese version. Again, this was, this was long before Kraken releases, uh, official dvd release in 2016 i think mm -hmm. as for general impressions um i've always really really liked this one back when i was a little more flippant in my views on godzilla i always called this my definitive favorite godzilla movie nowadays i don't really think about the godzilla franchise in that way because i find that i, I find that this series has so many great entries that are great in their own unique individual ways that i think it's kind of silly to like you know pick one over all the others because mm -hmm. One movie is very good in its own way. Another one's probably equally good in its own way. But this is definitely a film that I hold with extremely high regard. Um, I absolutely agree with you 100% that it's much more than just a historical footnote in the franchise. It's not just the movie that gave birth to, uh, well, we can talk about the technicalities later, but the film that gave birth to the Heisei series. It's not just the film that made Godzilla the bad guy again. I think this is actually, you know, one of the better films that Toho has produced in this franchise, you know, to date. And it's a film that I have a lot of admiration for. It's a film that I think about quite often. And, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to uh, talk about it today. Awesome, awesome. I keep, now, no offense, I keep forgetting how young all you guys are. Because it's <laughs> like, yeah, you only discover Japanese Godzilla through Godzilla 2000. It's like, wow, you were... And I was a little I was a little later in my childhood uh, mm -hmm. when I saw that one. I think, I, see, Godzilla, let's see, the TriStar Godzilla came out in 98, so I would have been like seven at that time. So I was a little older than the average person who gets into these kind of things. Most people see these things from what I gather, when they're like, you know, really, really, really young, like, like say five or under. Mm. So I was a little, I was a little later getting to this friend, getting to this franchise. Godzilla has always been kind of a pop culture boogeyman. Um, like we know who the character is simply through cultural osmosis, 
mm-hmm. but we never but you know back then especially in a time where there was no internet um, home media wasn't as readily available as it is now yeah it's like we would know Godzilla would exist but we wouldn't really know if these you know what these movies are thankfully I grew up in the time in the early 90s where they still showed B movies and lesser lesser seen films constantly on television throughout multiple channels and networks channel 13 had a godzilla new year's day marathon back in 1990 with ironically had a guy in a really basic somewhat crummy looking michelangelo teenage mutant ninja turtle costume like hosting it but it was it it was really just pre-filmed i'm thinking that they had to get rid of a lot of those godzilla balloons before the copyright ran out so that was (laughs) let's like hey we're sending you godzilla balloons so and you know the big ones that you know kids would often battle and punch, and I think I ha- I think we had at least one of those. So we didn't get them through the marathon, but we got them through Toys R Us as they were still selling them. Um, but what's funny about Godzilla 1985 is that I may have seen clips of this movie long before I saw that fateful New Year's Day marathon. My mom and dad and my brother Miguel were watching this you know terrifying looking charcoal colored dinosaur and demon destroying Tokyo and you know and, and those shots of like the close up of Godzilla roaring and everything with like the razor sharp uh, toothpick mm. teeth did not help and I was so terrified that I ran away from the bedroom um, so when the Godzilla New Year's Day marathon came about that was definitely kind of a revelation to actually see these movies in full and be really deeply impressed with them because they weren't like anything that was being done at the time to be honest and it's like not only are these monsters impacting the real world they're as real as the world they menace but the you know the people of japan are well aware of these characters there's no skirting around whether or not they are real or if the public is on ignorant of their existence and this and to be fair as awesome as a lot of special effects sequences from 80s films were the fact that there was this giant dinosaur attacking in broad daylight really you know, with these really well done model sets, um, really was kind of just mind blowing for a little kid like that. It's like you can actually do that on film. I can't believe it. You know, it's like I thought you only did this kind of thing on cartoons. Um, but with that says, shortly after that, I wanted to see more Godzilla movies, and the only Godzilla movie readily available at mom and pop shops were, of course, the like you said, the New World um, VHS for Godzilla nineteen eighty five. And it was ironic finally seeing that movie for the first time. I By that point, you know, I was full on Godzilla. Of course, I was still a little scared of horror and monster movies. So the whole scene with the sh- Shikolis, sh- the terrible sea louse. Shokiros, yeah. Mm-hmm. Shokiros, yeah. That was always a sequence I would cover my 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 uh, my eyes with. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, now looking back on it, it's like, why was I afraid of this? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get to Shikorus, uh later. Um, and of course, as a oh god, I'm, it's probably best to admit this now. But yeah, I, I sobbed like I sobbed like a little baby when Godzilla fell to, to his supposed doom. And of course, back then um, there was no knowledge of Godzilla versus Biollante um, mm-hmm. existing for uh, ignorant me in America. So I honestly thought that was the final Godzilla movie, so to speak. So, but no, um, with that says, though, the history behind this movie is very interesting, and I know that's one of the main reasons why I brought you aboard on this podcast, because you can definitely illuminate a lot of the behind-the-scenes thinking. Um, so, at infamously or famously, uh, either way, we all know that the Godzilla franchise took a very long rest after 1975. And, mm-hmm. it w- and would you say it was because of the box office failings of Terramecha Godzilla, or do you think there was multiple factors going on at the time? I'd say it was multiple factors. Um, there's never been any any kind of literature to even suggest that Toho at one point decided, okay, you know, no more Godzillas. It just seems to have, like, turned out that way. And it is known that Tanaka had been trying through... and uh, Tanaka and others had tried through numerous um, rounds to get films off the ground in the intermediate years. Bear in mind the fact that uh, Godzilla's Revenge up through Terramaki Godzilla were films that primarily played as matinees for kids rather than as big general releases for mainstream audiences. It was a very different climate than, say, even what, what it was in, like, say, the mid-60s, for example. Mm-hmm. Infamously, Terramecha Godzilla didn't do so well in the box office, despite being a generally good movie and some actual yes. effort was put into it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you're right. Um, the people behind Godzilla, it's like you. Ju- I just read like a bunch of John LeMay's um, books today, and there were so many attempts to try to get back uh, to bring back Godzilla in both the late '70s and further throughout the '80s, mm-hmm. um, to such a point that as interesting as those projects are, I'm kind of happy we never got any of them because I know that like God's like God's angry Godzilla, God's angry messenger. It sounds like a fantastic idea, but we really want to live in the dimension where we got that film <laughs> instead of Return of Godzilla, where it turns out Godzilla was an evil alien all the, all along. So one whose psychic powers can cause mass suicides between humans and lake monsters alike. I do know that I do know there was like one one plan to try to end the Godzilla franchise on a more satisfying note after Terra Mecha Godzilla with. Um, uh, Godzilla Tokyo Suicide Strategy or Tokyo SOS Strategy um, which of course is the one where it's a rematch against Gigan and a new invisible uh, robot monster Camille gone and I know that one was treated more as like a true ending to the show era because you know Godzilla's in like some truly dire straits and it's like his final big battle of course uh, throughout this history of like projects that never really saw uh, fruition Return of Godzilla had multiple different versions before it eventually did end up becoming the film that we know it today. And of course, mm-hmm. infamously, that's um, one of those versions featured uh, the pain in every, everyone's side as far as annoying Godzilla fandom goes. Bagan or uh, Bacon. <laughs> so, like, I got nothing against Bagan himself, but the character has just been so overhyped by the fandom, it's ridiculous. To such a point that nobody gives a crap about Godzibon. But the minute there's a Bagan puppet showing up in an obscure <laughs> stage show special, it's like, oh my god, this is the greatest thing in my life. <laughs> mm. I think the idea of bringing back Godzilla and kind of doing a back to basics uh, with some interesting additions, without going overboard, like, oh, Godzilla's got to find another monster, and we got to throw with, we got to throw all the weird sci-fi weapons in this movie. Mm-hmm. Granted, we got a couple of weird sci-fi weapons in this movie, but they're pretty subtle and effective. Although with that says, I, I I do want to get your opinion on this little theory of mine. It seems Return of Godzilla was also kind of not only was it Return of Godzilla literally and figuratively, but it was sort of like a part of a cycle of movies that happened after the kaiju genre kind of died out in Japan of like science fiction and disaster related movies because I tend that's something a lot of Godzilla fans tend to ignore or um, completely are ignorant about. That after, you know, the Godzilla cycle, the original Showa series ended, Toho was still making, like, historical films and disaster films and Mm sci-fi films that still had a lot of special effects sequences in them, arguably even more than the Godzilla films could muster. Mm -hmm. So, and it feels like Return of Godzilla is sort of like the the kind of quota or the capita of that little uh, mini-cycle of effects films but also kind of honoring the kaiju films that came before in a way. So it kind of like came full mm-hmm. circle. Is that kind yes. of safe to say? Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, around this time we also well before the film came out, we had films like, you know, Submersion of Japan, mm-hmm. which was a gigantic hit in Japan and uh was a big lavish huge expensive film. That was a film that Toho put a lot of money into because they had a a big audience to shoot for. The film was based on a very popular uh, novel by Kamatsu Sakyo. Mm-hmm. And uh, they could afford to uh, splurge with a film like that, and it and it paid off. And after that, you had films like uh, Deathquake, for example, in 1980, which also had special effects by Nakano Teriyoshi. Yes. Um, and so, from, yeah. just to quickly add to Deathquake, I read John LeMay's book. He says Deathquake was kind of like a movie made from all the abandoned concepts and scenes that weren't done for uh, Submersion of Japan. So it's it also bears a strong resemblance to uh, the movie Earthquake with uh, Charlton Heston. Mm, oh yeah, good point. In Hollywood, you know, you had the uh, disaster movie craze of the '70s and whatnot. You know, mm-hmm. Airport and Tower Inferno and the Poseidon Adventure mm-hmm. and Earthquake, as we mentioned. So uh, and Tom yeah, really out say, the like, best you know, Toho was movie. obviously aware of films like that. So uh, yes. I, have, I don't know if they consciously thought about this when they made the film, but uh, I'd say you're absolutely right. It, it is like you know a fine mesh between. You know, the kaiju stuff and the disaster movie kind of thing. You know, absolutely. Now, just to quickly add on to those films, could we also include Last Days of Planet Earth, despite the fact that the film ended up getting banned? Yeah, I would, yeah absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, there was like historical dramas too. I know that our mutual friend um, David, aka Titan Goji, 
uh, has mentioned some of the late 70s uh, war movies that Toho produced that had a lot of uh, special effects sequences in them. Okay, but yeah, no, it is kind of neat that it did kind of, again, went full circle from like kaiju films, the disaster of science fiction films, back to kaiju films. And mm -hmm. I do like, like, one of the things I really like about Return of Godzilla is the setup. The first half is setting up uh, the events in which will eventually lead to Godzilla coming on shore, so to speak, to, to Japan. Once he does make it to Japan, the rest of the movie is kind of, a, like, again, getting back to the Deathquake Earthquake comparison. Like, there is the initial attack, there's the aftermath, but because our so-called <laughs> natural disaster is a sentient animal... Um, he, he definitely comes back in the climax to cause more mayhem. One of the things I always found interesting about the film was it is a return to basics, and the idea of of making it just basically a Godzilla as the main threat and all these different human characters uh, dealing with Godzilla. Although, granted, it's still a fairly small cast as opposed to, like, the Showa movies where we would have a lot of side characters and... Uh, mm -hmm. And you do get a feeling that we are going to get a bunch of side characters, but they're really just, like, minor cameo fodder. Like, yes. our, like our lead uh, news reporter, um, Goro, his, his little um, camera photographer friend just disappears mm. after a few minutes. Who so, was played by uh, Hayashiya Shimpei, who people know for uh, making a lot of uh, fan films. Really? That's him? Yeah. That's him, yep. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness, that probably explains why he why he's dressed up in a foam uh, giant, uh, monster suit half the time. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, okay, that makes so much sense considering how kind of silly and wacky that character is. And there, and knowing you, you're probably going to point out a lot of other familiar play, uh, faces because I swear the government cabinet that shows up throughout the movie is filled mm -hmm. with like a lot of like veteran Japanese actors. Oh yes, abs absolutely, hundred percent, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes, from in and out of the Godzilla franchise, I figure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. but yeah, um, but no, I do love how the movie does start off as a genuine mystery, but it isn't like a like it's not like certain kaiju films or certain Japanese uh, science fiction or horror films where it takes forever to get to the mystery because we're still very intrigued about, you know, the survival of some of these characters, um, mm -hmm. as well as the characters just kind of processing what's going on right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like watching the original Japanese version of Return of Godzilla, I found it interesting how they don't exactly identify Godzilla right away. The Shokiras attack. Which, the giant sea lice. Yes, the giant sea lice. Um, like that's mentioned, and of course the idea that God, you know, there was a monster that came out of the rocks, but then when it's later confirmed to be Godzilla, suddenly there's like more gravitas to it because I guess mm -hmm. the characters considered this is just a new monster showing up. I know one of the criticisms people have with this movie is that the dialogue is a little on the vague side, so you really don't know if this is Godzilla literally returning or if it's a second member of the species. Would you say that's kind of just like kind of a vague uh, writing on the script's part, or do you think it's just the way the movie operates? It doesn't really concern itself that much with quote unquote continuing the first film story. It just more it just uses the first film story as an excuse to have this new film. It, it's, it really does seem like you're know, looking at interviews with the staff, including um, uh, Hashimoto, the director. It seems like they were just more interested in like you know, hey, what if something like Godzilla attacked today? Mm -hmm. That seems to have been like you know their their driving force, and they didn't seem to be as interested in like you know how does this film latch itself onto the first movie? You know the first movie exists. There's and all the films that happened between the first movie and this movie just never happened. It seems to have been about as far as they thought about that, and they didn't seem to be as concerned about that. They're more interested in like you know presenting, oh hey Godzilla attacks today in 1984, how does the world respond? That's actually something that that Hashimoto, the director Hashimoto Koji. Uh, who was a former assistant of Honda Ishiro's, actually. Mm -hmm. um, he said in interviews that, you know, he wanted to answer the question of, like, you know, aside from pressure from Godzilla fans, aside from monetary reasons, why are we making a Godzilla film today in 1984? Mm. And that seems to, and that definitely comes across all the way through this entire movie. Like, you know, hey, Godzilla attacks, how does the world respond? Not just Japan, how does the entire world respond? How does the Cold War superpowers respond and whatnot? That seems to be more, more the thesis and the goals of this movie. One, that's one of the things I found most interesting about the Japanese version of this movie, that it, it has a bit of an international feel to it. Yes. And thankfully, this was still a time, I don't know if this was still a time where Toho still had a lot of expat, expatriates and other foreign actors heavily available in Japan. Oh, yeah. So, and they were able to fill up with a lot of really um, not exactly the best actors, but def definitely, you know, some. they were able to fill it, make it feel more like an international mm -hmm. affair. 
as opposed yeah. to a lot of like Japanese monster movies where they can barely afford foreign actors, especially more recent years. Like, you know, Shin Ultraman, for example, as much as I enjoyed that movie, it really felt ridiculously small scale. And I know it was filmed during the pandemic, but at the same time, it's like not, n no cameo from that really cool German actress telling us, oh, we're going to help you discover the secrets of Zeton. <laughs> so. Do you feel the real world politics, political aspects of the film were incorporated effectively into the story? In a couple of weeks or so, we'll be doing a podcast with our friend Brain about Kurosawa's *The Bad Sleep Well*. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're going and one thing I will talk about in that podcast is how Toho is very gun shy about criticizing current administrations mm -hmm. for bad decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurosawa dealt with that numerous times in his career. It applied during Honda's day. I don't know if Honda was directly told to uh, was directly instructed about these kind of things, but um, in the 1950s, for example, you know, uh, Japan had nuclear weapons on its shorelines you know the american um military bases had nuclear weapons on japanese soil i did you know, not stored. know that yeah you know because you know this is this is the time of the korean war and as you might know uh harry truman thought about using nukes on korea to end the war this was very well known because there were protests and such like oh, hey what if these things blow up on our own soil accidentally and honda's films never incriminated you know the japanese government for that i think it's you often see like in films like say the mysterians for example some world power would say, hey, let's drop a nuclear weapon on, say, the aliens to end this problem. And some Japanese scientists will say, that's not a good idea. Let's not do that. Yeah. In actuality, if that did happen, the bomb that would have been dropped on the Mysterians would have, been, would have come from a base in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, film, the films never brought that up or cited Japan for having been involved in this kind of thing. As for uh, the 84 Godzilla, you know, at this time, you know, there were nuclear weapons being stored. You know, again, American nukes being stored in Japan. You know, with the Japanese government's knowing of, and of course, this film doesn't bring doesn't acknowledge that either. Uh, so, in a sense, you could maybe point that out as an example of the film not going all the way in terms of criticizing, you know, or articulating the Cold War elements of the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's also I'd also just say that's just you know very consistent with Toho is that they generally don't make films that criticize mistakes of the current administration because that's considered very upsetting and again we'll talk about that how kurosawa akira had to deal with that numerous times in the course of his career and that's that's something we'll, we'll go into our podcast on the bad sleep well yeah but that said, like you know the film does deal with the whole subject of like you know oh hey if godzilla did attack a nuclear submarine from the soviet union how does the soviet union respond how does the united states respond when they're accused of you know sinking the nuclear submarine mm -hmm. so you, you have you definitely have a whole lot of that you know tension going on uh, throughout the whole thing. And the movie does uh, sort of bring back in uh, Honda's notion of, you know, cooperation. Although, and here's going to be a major hot take of mine, I would argue that this film deals with the notion of Cold War superpowers cooperating far more effectively than Honda did in films like Goreth, <laughs> Mysterians, and Bow in Outer Space. In Honda's films, uh, you oftentimes have this very very optimistic notion of like, you know, there's a big threat and the entire world immediately drops all their problems mm -hmm. and comes together for mutual survival. Or in films like say, Goreth or Bound Outer Space where we, we're, we, we live in a non-existent future in which, you know, everybody already does coexist peacefully. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, you know, while it was nice of Honda to include stuff like that in his films, I would argue that it doesn't amount in his films, in most cases, it doesn't amount to much more than good intentions because while it isn't thoughtful, it's very naive. And in my opinion, it's very weak storytelling because I think that the way you get across a message is by dramatizing the subject. And to point to a better example from Honda's own filmography, I would argue the uh, case where he did that best was not in any of his big ambitious space operas, but was actually Mothra versus Godzilla. The, the idea of the, uh, the infant Islanders whose island was destroyed by civilization and the people from and the people who from, people from civilization now need their help to stop Godzilla. And they're like, well, why should we help you? And there's that great scene, which is which everybody always remembers, where the main characters give this speech about you know forgiving one another. And that's the reason why, at least for me and probably for most people, that's that message in that film really hits strongly because it's not just Honda saying a nice thing; he's dramatizing it through a very compelling story. Mm -hmm. And that's why I find the me the message of unity in Mothra versus Godzilla more effective than something like, say, Goreth, because 
again, the, there's no conflict between the characters. There's no conflict between the nations. Again, it's, it's nice and thoughtful of Honda to imagine a world in which that exists, but it's not, for me at least, it's not very dramatic and it's not very interesting. The show and movies, they, def- they definitely have more of a fantasy fairy tale bent to them. Mm-hmm. And especially, like you said, with the space operas or the near future uh, adventure films. Um, it does feel like, oh, this is the idealized future. And I, I'm much more appreciative of it than most people are. Because you look at a lot of, like, 50s movies where it's, like, regard like the country of origin is always front and center. Yeah. And there's very little um, um, lip service given to any other nation or people on Earth. Um, and that's always something I always appreciated about the Showa-era Godzilla films. But with that says, yeah, I think you definitely have to add more of an edge to it and a bite in order to get the message across, which I think, like you said, Mothra versus Godzilla does beautifully well. And I think this film does really well because, yeah, at the end, the nations do come together to work, but it's under not the best circumstances, and there mm-hmm. was a bit of skullduggery going on. Thankfully, not to, like, the paranoid, dark extremes that we'd see in the American recut. Mm-hmm. And definitely from a point where things were still optimistic, where you th- where you could actually have some kind of trust in the world leaders, even if the world leaders yes. could not get along. As opposed to the day where it's becoming more like a nightmarish Looney Tune shows every day. <laughs> a Looney Tune cartoon with each and every passing day. <laughs> so. Yes, you know, and you know, one thing that I admire tremendously about the return of Godzilla is how it, you know, keeps its plot threads relevant throughout all three of its acts. And mm-hmm. that's definitely true of the of the notion of this being an international event. I mean, when Godzilla first attacks that submarine, he almost brings us World War Three. Yeah. But and then you have then you then the world powers may start trying to drop a nuclear weapon on Japan to stop Godzilla. But and of yeah. course, you also have the whole scene where the prime minister has to negotiate a, a standstill between the countries, mm-hmm. you know, persuading them not to use nuclear weapons. And he does it by appealing to their humanity. Yes. You know, how would you react if, uh, if if Godzilla attacked your country and your only solution was to, nu- was to nuke him and you killed so many of your people in the process? He does it by, through, a huma- through a humanitarian gesture. Mm-hmm. And then in the, thir- in the third act, you know, you have the three nations working together. You know, you have the, the Russians inform the Japanese that the that another nuclear weapon has been fired towards Tokyo, and you have the American and the, the Americans shoot it down to stop it. It's not it's not enough to uh, prevent total disaster because, as we all know, it revives Godzilla. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's there's still that notion of cooperation between the three countries. There's no Honda style utopia at the end of the film, but you mm-hmm. still get a notion of cooperation between the superpowers. Oh yeah, and, yeah. and it does. And again, it, the reason why I admire this film, and I would argue that it does, it does, it gets across some some of Honda like some Honda like notions more effectively than Honda did sometimes, is that it dramatizes it. It doesn't yes. just have a presentation of you know everybody come together. You get you get you get that you know cooperation after some great tension and some great suspense and some real interesting storytelling, mm-hmm. and that gets the point across very viscerally, at least for me. Yeah, I, I would have to like I think the best example of that is the way the the way the Russians are handled in this movie. They're mm-hmm. not perfect, but they're far from villainous, especially mm-hmm. when you see with the character of Colonel Kashirin, um, played by Luke Johnston, who is co- of course the one who. He's disappointed that atomic bombs won't be used to destroy Godzilla, but he's also the one who unfortunately sacrifices his life trying to stop the bombs mm-hmm. accidentally activating. Um, so, yeah, like, like, and I do love the fact that, you know, once the Russian missile is accidentally released, immediately we cut to the same uh, secondary Russian ambassador we saw in the big meeting, basically mm-hmm. informing Japan, oops, you know, we made a big mistake, we got to take care of this. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think this film does handle the Cold War politics a lot better. It's n- n- nuanced, as you said, and definitely a lot of shades of gray without being, like, cowardly in presenting those shades of gray. It's not like a mm-hmm. centrist view of the world, so to speak. We're, we won't go too much into detail until we get to the film proper, but, yeah, a lot of the, lot of the nuance was completely abandoned in the American version. And do we know why for sure? Because I keep hearing conflicting reports, like the head of New Line was like an extreme patriot, or they just felt it wasn't good for story reasons, or it was just easy to make the paint the Russians as complete bad guys, Com- complete with the almost embarrassing sequence of uh, Colonel K- uh, Kasharin, you know, pressing the button. <laughs> Well, uh, it, as you said, as you said, there's a, there's definitely a lot of contradiction, including contradiction from the same sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you know, R.J. Kaiser, who uh, directed the um, 
the new scenes from the new world version he's answered the question of like you know about those changes differently over the years i mean in steve rifle's book on the godzilla franchise and in the uh, stuff that was published in video watchdog um he said it was because of a political slant to keep on this, this is the film this film came out came along in the time of the reagan administration where you definitely had the whole evil mm -hmm. empire us versus the russians mm -hmm. kind of thing going on mm -hmm. and and kaiser in those in some of those original interviews said like oh yeah no, it was done for very conservative reasons but nowadays uh, there seems to be a lot of arguments from him and from other people involved in the production that that was not the point that they that was not a factor at all and that they the reason why they had the whole thing of uh the guy intentionally launching the missile was to just give the film a little more of an action suspense feel to it um but again, that's what that's what they're saying nowadays, and that's that sort of contradicts what was said around the time Godzilla 1985 was, you know, semi-new. So um, part of the reason why there is that, you know, conflicting reports is because some sources, as sometimes happens in film studies, answer the same question differently as time goes by. Yeah, yeah, and it may, it may also be a case of um, there's some things about Godzilla 1985 that I think are actually pretty strong in their own right, uh, regardless yeah. if you compare them to the original film or not. Mm -hmm. But I will say, in argument against the Godzilla the 85 cut, it does have a bit more of a, a more cynical, simplistic slant to it than the original Return of Godzilla does. And I do feel mm -hmm. a lot of the decisions made to help kind of make the movie have better pacing and all that kind of ruins whatever the again the nuance or the gray zone of the original film had to offer mm -hmm. so and i i do feel that the idea of the russians accidentally releasing this bomb even though it was ready they had it you know ready to go is a little I'm not, I'm not defending the decision but i can kind of see how that would be a little too complex for you know the groundlings in the audience hence mm -hmm. they just you know went on with this other idea it's like oh yeah the fanatical russian guy <laughs> presses mm -hmm. the button regardless um but yeah yeah i can def i can definitely see the you know the state of that had the state of america affected a lot of the story points of uh of godzilla 1985 how do you feel japan itself is represented in this film because i know a big theme that was going on in japanese films from like all from the 60s all the way up to the 90s was how japan kind of felt they were trapped in the middle ground of the Cold War, so to speak. Yeah. And after what you just said about American bases actually had missiles, uh, you know, stationed mm -hmm. on, on Japan soil, uh, now it's it's a lot more clearer to me than it was before. Before I thought it was just, oh yeah, Japan is literally in the middle of American Russia. No, mm -hmm. Japan literally was forced into the conflict, so to speak. This film, we should mention, it doesn't just, you know, criticize nuclear weapons it criticizes nuclear energy in all its forms because what draws mm -hmm. godzilla to japan in the first place is nuclear power and unlike the 2014 godzilla in mm -hmm. which a bomb goes off by san francisco and there's no after effects whatsoever mm -hmm. you know, in this case you know a nuclear weapon goes goes off above tokyo it doesn't cause any physical damage to tokyo but it knocks out the power it cripples the super x and more importantly it revives godzilla there are consequences to the use of nuclear weapons in this film and yeah. nuclear energy in this film yeah so, th this film does handle the, the you know the fact that godzilla has always been a specter of the atomic bomb or just new uh, man's hubris gone you know out of control um not as to the same extent as like the classic frankenstein but it's definitely a per godzilla is definitely a perfect example of what a monster truly is an mm -hmm. abomination born of abominable circumstances and sadly, as you mentioned with the 2014 movie and probably Godzilla films in recent years, the allegory of what Godzilla is, the thing that truly makes the character special and, and, and a serious contender to the history of fiction in general, has been whittled down just to appeal to mass audiences. And to, I, I don't want to say dumbed down, but it definitely feels that way. It's like, especially what's like as much. I know, I I know, you, I enjoy Shin Godzilla a lot more than you do, but even I do agree that the nuclear allegory getting lost in that movie is pretty insulting. Especially at the end, it's like, oh, Godzilla's radiation only has a half life. Granted, though, there's also the extreme opposite of that same coin, where I've seen a lot of American fiction treat the nuclear allegory maybe too seriously, and then all of a sudden Godzilla is pumped up is bumped up to like cthulian levels of dread and horror where 
oh, he just shows up and the whole world is poisoned and cancerous. But yeah, I think this film handles that a lot better. It definitely balances out perfectly. In addition to how you feel about how Japan is betrayed politically, also, this movie, how much does it represent 80s Japan, so to speak? Because I figure things were going fairly well for Japan, at least economically. And that is a point that they do bring out, bring up in both versions of the film. It's like, oh yeah, we got to keep Godzilla's secret because it'd be bad for business, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it's like, who wants to do business in Japan when Godzilla could pop up at any moment? So, mm -hmm. yeah, like I, like I said, you know, the film kind of looks the other way at the fact that you know, in real life, Japan did have American nuclear weapons being stationed mm -hmm. in Japanese territory, and you know, in the uh, Third act of the film, when the missile gets launched, one Japanese bureaucrat says, I was there a control board for a nuclear weapon in Tokyo Bay. You know, in actuality, oh yeah, there's lots of those. <laughs> but, but, uh, but of course, again, this, this being a Toho film, obviously they weren't going to incriminate the current powers that were. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, and again that's, that, that, that applies throughout long parts of Toho's history. Um, anyhow, so, but yeah, absolutely. You're, this is definitely a film that's, uh, Japan is... Uh, very quickly becoming a major economic superpower. Much of the film's climax takes place in Shinjuku, the main business part of Tokyo, amongst all those gigantic skyscrapers, mm. which are very much a big part of Japan of Japan's renaissance over the years. I mean, don't forget when they made, when they made the first Godzilla movie, Godzilla was taller than pretty much everything around him mm -hmm. because there were laws at that time which stipulated that you know buildings in Tokyo could only be so high. Well. That doesn't that that law doesn't exist anymore at this time, and now buildings are substantially much bigger. Mm -hmm. And you have God's and you have Godzilla, you know, fighting the Super X amid all these huge, enormous skyscrapers that are again in Tokyo's main business district. Now Nakahara, the screenwriter, said that uh, the reason why he put the uh, the climax in Shinjuku was because he thought it'd just be interesting to have Godzilla amongst all these big buildings. He didn't indicate any kind of big political notion behind it. Mm -hmm. But I think you could still argue that it's still there a little bit, especially since, you know, in the beginning of the film, they talk about things like, you know, again, you know, if Godzilla, if word of Godzilla comes out, there's panic and that stops the stock market. Also, this notion in the international conference, uh, the uh, finance minister brings up the notion of like, oh, hey, if Tokyo is destroyed, Japan's economy is destroyed as well. Mm -hmm. So the film doesn't doesn't, you know, harp on the uh, bubble economy stuff as aggressively as, say, Godzilla versus King Ghidorah did a couple years later in its own <laughs> weird nationalistic way. I've come but, to uh, pop your bubble, Japan. <laughs> Check out but, my uh, giant stick. I'm Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still nonetheless reflected in the movie. And that's something that's, that I think is also uh, appealing about the Godzilla franchise in general is that, you know, throughout history, these films, you know, they do reflect political events, economic events, or whatever that were happening. Sometimes that's the, that's the focus of the story. Sometimes it just happens in the background as just a little glimpse into what was happening in the world at the time. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely not a film that makes the economy its direct focus. Again, this this movie's more about the notion of like, oh, hey, Godzilla appears in the world today. What happens? Yes. But you can definitely see a little bit of that in the movie as well. Yes. Two points I want to bring up that you mentioned. The big climax of this movie takes place in Shinjuku. And I do love the fact that even knowing that this is a much bigger version of Godzilla, he's 80 meters as opposed to the original 50 meters mm -hmm. uh, from the 54 movie. I've always, I've always admired the fact that this movie has such great set design and art direction. And mm -hmm. that even knowing Godzilla is a much bigger version of himself than ever before, he's still um, dwarfed by a lot of his surroundings. I think it, it visually it's much more interesting than, say, some of the latter Heisei films. Where Godzilla oh, yeah. gets so ridiculously big, it's like he's literally stepping on shoeboxes with little pinholes put in for windows. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I've always enjoyed a lot about um, particular g giant monster media. It's like, yes, your monsters are huge, but they're not so ridiculously huge that they're still overwhelmed by the city surroundings. Mm -hmm. And it's, it also adds the more interesting action sequences, too. You know, it's like... Godzilla and the Super X basically playing the world's deadliest form of hide and seek through yes. the buildings of Shinjuku and of course that great sequence which apparently from what I understand was come up with the effects artist and wasn't really in the script uh, proper was that Godzilla just ends up pushing a, a giant Shinjuku building on top of the Super X mm -hmm. in that great sequence where the camera just zooms in on his like really annoyed face it's like yeah take that you son of a bitch <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know if it was in the script, but I do know that they had some different ideas for how Godzilla would actually win. Like, um, mm-hmm. in a in storyboards drawn up by uh, Miyoshi uh, Kunio, who would later direct the infamous Rebirth of Mothra 2, <laughs> <laughs> um, he envisioned Godzilla defeating the Super X by just knocking out this guy with his tail. Mm. You know, kind of like kind of like what Godzilla did to the male Muto in 2014. Right. But uh, I'm thankful they didn't do that, because while it might, that might have been kind of like a cool, sudden victory move... It definitely is. A, it's much more effective here, like you said. You know, having them like you know, u- using the in- having the environment be a big part of the battle strategy. Mm-hmm. It's not just the it's not just Godzilla and the Super X exchanging shots amid buildings. Like the Super X is hiding behind skyscrapers. Godzilla is blasting holes through the skyscrapers. Super X is, is like moving laterally, and Godzilla is chasing it. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, you have that great moment where Godzilla cripples it, and he kind of like chases it slowly as it kind of like you know lose its ability to stay airborne hits the ground, and he pushes over the Sumitomo uh, skyscraper, which crushes it very satisfyingly. And then, yeah, you get that long, slow zoom in on him with all that great red backlighting. Not to mention the smoke. The, like, I yeah. know they, they had no way to control all that fog and dust, but the way it just gathers around him, it's like it, it's mm-hmm. almost a perfect shot the way that one was executed. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's like the smoke is solely surrounding him, but it doesn't obscure him immediately. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, but no, I do I do think, like, visually, they definitely got the model sets. And, like, granted, the model sets aren't 100% realistic, but atmosphere-wise, it's it's beautiful. It's fantastic. It's probably the best Tokyo has ever looked in any of these Godzilla films without actually filming real Tokyo and putting in a CGI Godzilla in the middle of it. So, mm-hmm. um, Yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of really interesting uh, choices of camera angles throughout this whole movie. Yeah. Um, Oftentimes you see Godzilla through windows or cockpits, mm-hmm. emphasizing his size. Lots of great low-angle photography. Um, mm-hmm. You see a shot of him reflected in the windows of buildings. Yes. You know, there's a lot of really interesting and very clever ways of photographing the monster throughout the entire movie, and uh, which really gets across the sense of size and scale. And again, you know, great sense of relation to, of the monster to its environment. Mm-hmm. Which I think is integral to making you know, one of these films very effectively. I do like how they go out of their way to show the people's point of view from what they see of Godzilla and how many mm-hmm. times people are so close to the monster. You know, mm-hmm. it's like whether it's a sequence where it's like the two helicopter pilots see Godzilla rise out of the water for the first time, or the sequence where um, everyone's gathered around Godzilla's supposed dead corpse and then he wakes up. You know, just you're you're in the middle of the riot along with seeing Godzilla's point of view of them and back and mm-hmm. forth. So yeah, yeah, there there is like even again the special effects and the execution isn't one hundred percent perfect because there are some pretty shoddy sequences. Like when we see Godzilla looking into the train car, it's an effective mm-hmm. sequence, but at the same time, it just it feels a little bit like green screen optical effects needed to be cleaned up a little bit there. But yeah. yeah, at the same time, it, it I definitely appreciate the level of experimentation that we're going with this movie. It's something mm-hmm. that they would definitely kind of arguably be a lot better with in the next film, Godzilla vs. Biollante, which mm-hmm. itself is worthy of a podcast in its own right. Yes. Um, but yeah, it is something that we do kind of miss out with a lot of the latter era Godzilla films in the 90s, where it's just where a lot of those like really cool sequences and just like little tricks here and there are completely abandoned and just and suddenly the human action and the giant monster sequences just feel so boring and separated from one another so like very disconnected this is the best way i can describe it before we mention the you know the 20 foot tall robotic elephant in the room (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah or or godzilla Godzilla's constantly size changing stomping feet yes, depending on the um, scenes. <laughs> which is a, a recurring problem throughout the entire franchise going all the way back to the first movie um, mm-hmm. whenever you do superimpose a real life background in front of the monster the, the scale in, inevitably changes Terameki Godzilla in particular is very guilty of this <laughs> <laughs> yeah like one, one moment Titanosaurus is like two stories tall next moment he's bigger than God behind the mountain <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and there are some shots of the uh, the elephant in the room that definitely do not look the best. Um, mm-hmm. But over, but overall, like you know, the model work is very good. The suit looks very good. The suit is very very well photographed. The lighting is effective. Mm-hmm. You know, Nakano's uh, sp- uh, pyrotechnics, as they always are, are sheer eye candy. Yes. Um, so I would say that you know, overall, the uh, again, like they're definitely not they're definitely not consistent as pretty as is true of pretty much all Godzilla films. 
But I would say that, you know, the, the good special effects here definitely outweigh the bad. And when the effects are good, they're very, very good. Mm -hmm. And that definitely makes up for the parts that don't work. Yes, and getting back to the pyrotechnics, oh my god, chef's kiss to how awesome the pyrotechnics are. Although with that says Nakano, yeah, infamously he was famous for like, you know, even if he had low budgets, he really knew how to blow stuff up really well. Was this, was this one of Nako, Nakano's final uh, film productions as a special it effects was. director? It was, yes. Oh, okay. So, in a, so not, forgive the pun, but he went out with a bang. <laughs> as far as his Godzilla tenure goes, yeah, he did go out with a bang. Yeah, because because again, Nakano was in charge of a lot of special effects from you know throughout the seventies, and particularly mm -hmm. he did a lot of his best stuff with a lot of disaster and historical films. Yes, outside the Godzilla franchise, so it really feels like he's bringing all that talent and all those lessons he learned from those productions and mm -hmm. applied it to the kaiju genre. You definitely get a sense of extreme dread an almost apocalyptic dread at that with just the way Godzilla is handled throughout this movie. And with that says, um, I think bef before we get to the 20 foot tall elephant, robot elephant in the room, what do you think of Godzilla's redesign slash costume in this movie? I know you just said you really enjoyed it. Personally, I, th I think it's it's a very effective Godzilla design. Um, but like, like you said, with the uneven special effects and the fact that I saw this movie on the Kraken release um, Blu-ray, I forgot how kind of, I don't want to say it's a bad thing, but I forgot how loosey and flimsy the Godzilla suit looks. Growing up, this costume always seemed a lot more solid and, and muscular to me than it was seen again where, you know, you can kind of see some of the folds in the rubber move about, about like that. That's unfortunately a problem that applies to pretty much every Godzilla film you see it on a Blu-ray. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I can. I have yet. Yeah, I've yet to watch my Blu-rays of the Heisei Godzilla films, but I imagine his big thunky chai the thighs, or really get all jiggly in those. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you know, watching a lot of the Showa, Showa Godzilla films on Blu-ray, you can definitely see uh, breaks in the skin, creases, mm -hmm. folds, mm -hmm. Nak uh, Nakajima's face through the holes in the neck a little easier. <laughs> well, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I watched uh, Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster um, oh. again uh, last year. Yeah, in the final battle with Ebira, yeah, they're like, <laughs> Nakajima's nose is practically poking through the neck of the suit. So. Yeah, it, yeah, it's weird that there's a bunch of flesh-colored dots around the neck of Godzilla in that movie, so... <laughs> So, but yeah, no, Godzilla, uh, with that says, though, there has been sort of arguments with the way that, like, the overall design of this Godzilla is very good. But it's like, do you think it suffers from that situation where, depending on where this, the, the, the camera angle is, the Godzilla either looks incredibly menacing or he looks, unfortunately, derpy? Oh, yeah. Um, like, there's that, of course, that great shot, uh, great ironically, where um, at the beginning of the second battle of the Super X, you know, Godzilla roars at the Super X, then you cut like this close-up of him with his eyes all bent out of shape and pointing in different directions. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not the best uh, composition, not the best angle which to photograph the suit. At least they should have like you know fixed the eye position a little bit in there. But uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, and there are there are there are definitely some shots like that where he doesn't look the best. But then you have shots where he looks absolutely terrifying. So yes, oh yeah, definitely. Like Godzilla's. Godzilla's uh, big reveal in this movie is arguably one of the best reveals in mm, all of yes. all of giant monster movie history. Because I do love how it's like it starts off very again wonderfully atmospheric to the point where it's almost gothic, apocalyptically so. Mm -hmm. Where it just starts with like you know we just see the quiet early morning fog, a bunch of birds fly off into the air, and then it just goes it just dissolves into that beautiful fog. And then the mm -hmm. fog slowly moves out when we see the model set, and it's like, oh shit, we're seeing it from Godzilla's point of view, with like mm -hmm. the thunderless, um, the sound, the sound design in this is wonderful too. I have to admit. Yeah. Um, and 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 then finally you get that one poor guy who's coming outside, probably wondering where's where's all those loud noises coming from, and then the big reveal of like from Godzilla's foot all the way up to his face. It's like in that sequence, the suit is very well filmed. Um, and I love how the, the ground breaks open in front of that guy before you see Godzilla. Too. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So, Is it true that the Godzilla suit made for this movie was stolen after filming was wrapped up? I've heard that on the internet, but I've never seen an actual source mm -hmm. attached to that story, so I don't believe it. Okay, um, and, and plus they, they, 
from what I understand, they make more than just one suit. So, you know, yes. even if one got stolen, there'd still be at least like an A or B suit still around. Yeah, they, they built two suits for the film, one for the water scenes, one for everything else. And also, bear in mind the fact that, you know, Biolante comes five years after this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the materials in which, of which these suits are made, they deteriorate very quickly unless you take really good care of them. Mm-hmm. And Toho historically has not always done a very good job preserving these films. Oh, infamous photos from the 70s where all these great monster suits and special effects mm-hmm. props are just outside in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Not even covered. Um, but yeah, also, I think, it also, I think it also made sense just to build a new one for Biolante because, uh, okay, a little bit of a backstory here, but uh, uh, Satsuma Kepachiro, who plays Godzilla, mm-hmm. he was not the first choice to play Godzilla for this film. Um, as, as you mentioned, they... they uh, they increased Godzilla's size from 50 to 80 meters. And part of their strategy behind getting that point across of him being so much bigger, you know, besides, you know, making the uh, scale of the models a little smaller, part of their idea was to make the suit even bigger than they normally did. Mm. And so they initially hired Satsuma to help him find somebody who was a, uh, one of somebody he knew who um, was much taller, who could fit into a much larger suit. And they uh, actually sketched the outline for the suit to fit this much taller guy named, uh, Yamawaki Hiroshi, I believe, was his name. Mm. And he ended up backing out of the, of the project before the suit was actually started, before the suit was made. Um, so, And Satsuma stepped in to take his place, but they still built the suit according to Yamawaki's proportions. Oh, so, that would, ex- okay, that would explain some of the more, like, I again, I like this version of Godzilla, but yeah, that would explain some of the more fumpier <laughs> aspects of the body. And whereas with Biolante, it made only, only made logical sense at this point to build a suit designed for his proportions, which they kept doing for the rest of the, uh, the Heisei series. But, um, but yeah, for all those reasons, you know, the, uh, Satsuma, building a suit for Satsuma's uh, size, the fact that, you know, the materials in which these suits don't preserve well unless you take really good care of them mm-hmm. over a period of five years in this case, and the fact that there's never been a source to confirm the suit being stolen that I know of, I don't believe the stories of it being stolen. Yeah, and from from my memory, it's like, I think, I think it's safe to assume that the 84 costume was used in a lot of publicity and promotional events after the fact, so it probably yes. got extra... Um, wear and tear through that as well by the time we got to Biolante. Yeah, they actually, um, they shipped one of the suits, I don't know if it was the land suit or the water suit, they shipped one of the suits to America when New World was trying to promote Godzilla in 1985 and generate some publicity. They actually had that, one of the suits marching through uh, New York City, I think it was. Yes, I remember I remember seeing that in like Entertainment Tonight where it's like this Godzilla mm-hmm. suit was with these other costume characters at like a New York event. And they put a weirdly enough a golden dog collar around him for I don't know <laughs> for some weird reason or something. But yeah, and I do remember the Godzilla costume being you know much a lot shorter than a lot of the other people there. But then again, I think it may have been a case where they just didn't find the right sized actor to fill that costume in because Godzilla was even even frumpier towards the bottom <laughs> than it was in the movie itself. So, yeah, so I think that's another thing. Yeah, and five years is a long time for any monster suit. Well, they, they planned to make a sequel to this film. They were, they were talking about doing it in 1985, so pretty soon. Mm. But they very quickly, and they very quickly had Kazuki Omori attached to uh, direct it. But then they also kept stalling it out and assigning him to films that they thought were more commercially viable, you know, singing idol movies that, you know, Godzilla just wasn't a huge priority. So no reason to keep the suit in good condition. So, mm. um like, hey, it's it's more financially viable to have our hot new director make these films that have a, a much stronger promise of bringing in good box office. Plus, they're less expensive, so, you know, more returns for us mm-hmm. um, well, either way. Yeah, well, that kind of, like, se- segues to the fact that maybe they would have saved a lot more money if they didn't make a 20-foot-tall robot Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> The Cybot cost uh, $475,000 to make, I believe. And, oh, my God. Uh, had uh, one of the uh, making of books that was released when the film was new said that it was four meters tall. Uh, those Godzilla pictures book that the Godzilla store sells, which you can get through the internet, mm-hmm. says that it was 4.8 meters tall. So somewhere in the neighborhood between 13 and 18, 20 feet, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, it cost $475,000 to make, had about 3,000 individual moving parts. I think we can call it an ambitious misstep. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, you got you got to give them credit for trying to for trying to do something a little different here. Oh yeah, no, the idea of making okay in in theory, it was a great idea. The idea yeah. that all the close ups would be done with this much larger prop, and it is a fact. And even though you can't tell that it is a giant prop. Because, you know, you, there's really no uh, frame of reference within those sequences. But the fact that the explosions and the sparks on it, you know, come off a little more mm. realistic on this larger prop. Now, that's a good idea. Though, granted, I think they could have gone about it in a much more simplistic way. Instead of making this, like, 12 to 15 foot tall animatronic, they could have at least done, like, a 12 foot tall mega puppet. Kind of similar to some of the stuff they did with Attack on Titan and the unused effect sequences in Shin Godzilla. And I think mm -hmm. they could have gone away with it, you know, but at the same time, I think... I don't know, like, I admire the tenacity of building a giant Cybot Godzilla Godzilla um, robot, and some of the sequences with the up-close face is really good, even yes. knowing it doesn't exactly match with the, the soup design itself. Like, Superaya's mistake with his hand puppets was making the, the puppets so much smaller than the suit. Mm -hmm. uh, Nakano's mistake was making the Cybot so much bigger than the suit. <laughs> and then uh, Kawakita saw the wisdom in what everybody before him had tried to do with Biollante, and they mm -hmm. built a mechanical thing that was the same size as the suit. And by doing that, the skin of the uh, puppet can be cast from the same skins used to make the suit. Therefore, there's a greater sense of resemblance. Mm -hmm. And at that scale, you can, you can still control it by hand and get smoother movement, so... Yeah, yeah. It took, it took until Bialante for somebody to come up with a really effective secondary per, secondary method of portraying these monsters on screen, and yeah, the, the Cybot. Uh, yeah, you know, it's um, somebody you have to admire as an as an idea, and there are points in the film where it looks quite good. Mm -hmm. But then you have some points like you know, for example, and this would also be an example of a shoddier effect shot when Godzilla gets hit in the mouth by the Super X's cadmium missiles, and you get that kind of like you know profile shot of him, like you no. Know, jiggling his arms around and mm -hmm. kind of like you know, slumps down a little bit and <laughs> the expression in the face itself is great but then it's like this overly huge bubble head on this mm -hmm. relatively small monster body mm -hmm. so although from what i understand toho definitely got a lot of mileage out of the cybot in godzilla promotional events long after the fact wasn't one of the cybots final appearances in a promotional event was with space godzilla of all things actually uh even for even for the past that with destroyer Really? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think it was two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. I wrote an article about um, the uh, the reasons behind Godzilla vs. Destroya was made. And I interviewed um, Ed Gotticheski about that because he saw Destroya in the theater when the film was relatively new. He saw it in January uh, 96. And he also went to see a uh, suit display at the Ariake Coliseum. And outside and outside the, uh, the Coliseum on display was the Cybot Godzilla. And it was still... Every couple minutes, and go into a robotic, you know, set of pre-programmed movements. The skin was still in relatively good condition, so yeah. And this was, you know, eleven years after the film was made, and the and the prop was still in good enough condition to still be used for promotional events in open air. You know, and mm. open air is not always very good with the materials used to make these things, but it was, but it was still functional. It was still working, and uh, from what he said, it still moved about as well as it did or did not move in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it finally gained sentience and went on a killing a killing spree during Godzilla 2000. <laughs> <laughs> what I do enjoy about this film is, even though when they try to uh, take it back to basics with reintroducing Godzilla to Japanese audiences, I do appreciate that they weren't so ham ham fisted to be so simplistic. That they didn't mm -hmm. add a couple of like classic Toho super weapons along with the other military vehicles. Yeah, mm -hmm. and with with that says, even knowing the the red Maser cannons are not very impressive, um, as, you know, especially how slow they move and there's just you know sound effect with the lasers. I do think I do appreciate what they were able to do with the Super X, mm -hmm. and I do love how like for for what is basically a mini hover tank. I do love how they do give it like a lot of pomp and circumstance and I do love that it, because they couldn't put in like a secondary monster opponent for Godzilla in this movie. They do make up for it pretty well with the presence of the Super X, which is actually a pretty mm -hmm. effective weapon. And I yes. would I would like to see more of that in in just giant monster movies in general, like weapons outside <laughs> giant robots or world destroying oxygen destroyers. Being able to hold their own with kaiju or other similarly large creatures. 
I think it's a fantastic idea to um, introduce, uh, if you're not going to bring in a monster for Godzilla to fight, to actually do something which, which was actually kind of different for the French at this point, which was to fight Godzilla biologically. Mm-hmm. In this case, you know, they, they bring up, in the film, they bring up, you know, Godzilla feeds and thrives on nuclear energy. So the idea was use cadmium missiles to stop his nuclear processes and therefore hopefully kill him. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a smart idea. And also, like, the military is talking about fighting the monster. And one bureaucrat asks, do we have anything that can withstand Godzilla's heat ray? So they know they they kind of know what they're up against at this point. Like, okay, oh, hey, this this thing has a weapon that can decimate us. You know, do we have anything that can resist it? Mm-hmm. And that's when they bring that's when they introduce the Super X as a as a uh, failsafe against Godzilla's you know heat ray. And I think it, it makes totally logical sense to not only fight against have a weapon which can withstand up to a point Godzilla's signature weapon, but which also can use weapons to biologically they hope defeat him. And the Super X prop is an absolute astonishing success. You know, its ability to uh, create the impression of mass weight mm-hmm. is very effective. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's... as for the laser cannons, um, <laughs> yeah, they're, I think they're actually they're they're serviceable just in in what they what their function is in the store. Their their function is not to fight Godzilla, but just to guide him in between the buildings so the Super X can shoot him. Yeah, and that, I, I, I think. Work. Yeah, I think my big problem with the laser cannons is I think they're just not as filmed or as executed as well as the Super X is because yeah. the Super X is very well executed. Like you said, the mm. way it's it, it's able to glide gracefully, but it does it in a believable sense. Mm. It's not like some of the other super weapons that move way too fast. And you don't get any sense of movement towards it, mm-hmm. especially especially if they're done completely in CGI. Like I love the idea of a giant stealth bomber um, uh, base, mobile base, in the legendary Godzilla films. But it's it just feels a little ridiculous if it's that size and it's able to move as fast and as quickly as Rodan can. So, But mm. then again, everything feels weird in CGI as far as movement and weight goes. Um, but, but yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you that compared to the Super X, the laser cannons are not you know nearly as impressive a piece of model work. Absolutely. Yeah. With that, yeah. with that says though, do you feel this is a criticism a lot of people have brought up about this movie, uh, even people outside the kaiju fandom? Do you feel it was kind of a wasted opportunity not to go into more detail about the pilots within the Super X, not to kind of dwell, not to make their presence and story more significant? I can see the argument behind that. For me, it's not really a big problem because I think I think you do get you know heck you know when we when this when the Super Rex defeats Godzilla the first time you do get that moment inside where they're like you know congratulating one another so you do get a little bit of personality from them mm-hmm. you know no no more than necessary because they're not they're not major important characters but you still get a sense of accomplishment on them when they do momentarily win so I can I can definitely see the I can definitely see the argument for me it's not an issue though okay. Yeah, and to, and to be and I'm so yeah no the Super X is really cool and I'm glad it's still an element that we see return in a lot of Godzilla movies. It's not as iconic as maybe the Mazer cannon, but it is cool that it's like the second best of the super mm-hmm. weapons that's represented in the Godzilla franchise. Now, weirdly enough, we've been talking about a lot of the aesthetics of this movie, but we really haven't gotten into the human cast. And sadly, I know that's sort of a big um, point of contention with a lot of people, that the human characters are so unmemorable in these films. But I think this is definitely a Godzilla film where you can make the case that they're ver- they're more than serviceable. They're very effective. And you do have some really good performances in these various movies. Like, um, uh, I'm, forgive me for getting the names wrong, but uh, Keiju Koyo- uh, Kobayashi as the Prime Minister... Like, you know, he brings, like, that actor brings a lot of pesos to that particular character to such a point that <laughs> growing up as a kid, it's like, I want that to be my president, the Prime Minister of Japan. <laughs> he knows what to do. He knows what's up. But what do you think of the human characters of this film? I personally really enjoy them. Um, they all they all stay involved with the events of the story. Mm-hmm. You know, the Prime Minister of Japan is absolutely a fantastic character. Mm-hmm. You do get a lot. And Kobayashi, who was one of the great Japanese film actors, he's also in Submersion of Japan for those who are interested in. Oh, interested. nice. Um, yeah, he brings a lot of subtle power. He really demonstrates, you know, the advantages of subtle acting in this performance, you know, being very concentrated 
and just bringing a lot of gravitas through a very understated performance. Yes, it, and you, and you, well, it's, it's not it's understated, but you it still comes off across because even in the yes. dub version, you still get that performance really well. Mm -hmm. Although it also helps that with that dubbing, he's one of the characters who's treated one hundred percent seriously. Mm -hmm. So, but no, um, and of course we have our lead hero uh, Ken Tanaka as Goromaki, who. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's sort of a return to form with like the news reporter lead. Although mm -hmm. I do like how there is some um, again getting back to like the more not not the moral ambiguity, but sort of the gray zone this movie is good at. That he's not exact he's not exactly the heroic reporter of old. You mm -hmm. know, it's like there's a scene where he naively, if not ignorantly, you know, unites the brother and sister, but it's not completely out of good intentions. It's also to get a scoop mm -hmm. and a photo. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, who who's your favorite human character in this whole movie? Oh, easily the Prime Minister, with Dr. Hayashida being a close second favorite. I think I fully agree with you, yeah, because uh, Hayashida is also a cool character, too. I love how he's a scientist who isn't motivated by revenge. He's just motivated by curiosity to understand this mm -hmm. Godzilla character. And yes. do you, you think he... Like, it is hinted that he basically came came to this point over time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, time healed his wounds, and he just he's just interested to see how Godzilla works. Mm -hmm. uh, and thankfully, his, his plan to use m my bird, my... Well, okay, here's the thing, though. How do we feel about, like, what ultimately dooms Godzilla? Because, yeah, throwing him into a volcano would definitely do the trick that, you know, even if it was a temporary reprieve. But the idea that they, they use Godzilla's homing instincts, because he's, of course, a dinosaur instead of just a giant mutant lizard, despite what mm. American advertisers would say otherwise. But do you think it's effectively handled in the movie? Yeah. Again, I like what I like about this film is that they introduce ideas of fighting Godzilla biologically, not just using technology and mm -hmm. bombs and missiles. And I think it's a good idea to have you know the monster find a weakness in Godzilla's organism and exploit that it's not an action climax it's not pretending to be an action climax it's a very somber methodical very intentionally leisurely paced you know emotional finale and i think it works very effectively in that sense yeah it's like the human characters are all very good i'm glad it's a very huge cast and like you said there's a lot of recognizable faces from the Japanese films mm. of old. The finance minister in the film, who's the guy who, uh, the Japanese bureaucrat who, in the conference scene, is most in favor of dropping the bomb on Godzilla. Mm. You know, he's played by um, Ozawa Eitaro, who was, uh, he played a, a police commissioner in Honda's uh, The H-Man, but you know, he was a fantastic uh, character actor. Hayashida's played by Natsuki Yosuke, who was mm -hmm. in you know, The Three-Headed Monster, uh, Dogura, Kajima Yoshifumi, who played um, who played Kumiyama in Moth vs. Godzilla, he is one of the bureaucrats in the film as well. That's why he was so familiar and why I tried drawing a Hitler mustache on him. <laughs> <laughs> but should we also it talk about... It ought to be excellent, don't you think? <laughs> but should we also talk about the, the very wacky cameo that always confuses American fans? It pertains to uh, the train sequence. The yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, what's up with the priest? <laughs> Like a lot of things that confuse you know American fans when watching these films, there is actually a story behind that. Um, there is this very popular comedian slash filmmaker named Kitano Takeshi, who's made films like Hanabi, for example. He uh, started off as a very popular comedian, and he was in a TV show called Beat Takeshi's Academic Record. Mm. And in that show, there was a character of a teacher who dresses as a priest. And the actor who played him was a Hiroshi Kamiyatsu, who was a very popular singer and guitarist. Mm -hmm. And so they included this cameo in Godzilla 84 as kind of a nod to that TV show that you know, audiences in Japan knew at the time. Mm. So now, of course, New World was absolutely right to remove this for the 85 version because U.S. audiences had not, had not seen that TV show. Obviously, it would, have been, it would have been totally confusing to them, as it is to people watching the film today. But, you know, to audience Japanese audiences in 1984 watching this film, they would say, "Oh yeah, that character from uh, that, that TV show I saw this summer." Yeah, I, I guess I guess the equivalent would be like if you were watching like the King Kong train sequence, where King Kong just utterly destroys that train, and all of a sudden like Krusty the Clown is amongst the the people within. 
I guess it would be something similar to that, or it's or like a just out of nowhere cameo from like a well known comedian. <laughs> but let's cheer up with a can of Pepsi, our sponsor for tonight, <laughs> which also t- segues ways into the next segment, the American version of this film. So, mm-hmm. brought to you by Pepsi. Oh wait, no, not Pepsi, Dr Pepper. Can it? <laughs> I like Pepsi more than Dr. Pepper, but still. Yeah. yeah. yeah Dr. Mm-hmm. Pepper has a great taste. <laughs> but yeah, what, what do we think about... Um, okay, so the American version, Godzilla 1985. That's... that's mm. Okay, I do, I do love the fact that the Godzilla franchise, when they have alternate versions of movies, they have alternate versions of movies. You can almost say Godzilla 1985 is its own separate movie, much in the way that King of the Monsters is separate from the original Gojira. Mm-hmm. Or how... You, to go even further, Gigantus of the Fire Monster is a completely different beast, uh, pun intended, from Godzilla Raids again. So, mm-hmm. especially if you consider stock footage to be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> from reading John LeMay's book and some other um, articles, Toho tried um, shopping this movie around to various American studios, but they were asking too much of a of a price, like five million, to get mm-hmm. this film. And yes. they came close to getting two million with Universal Pictures. But Toho was um, <clears throat> had a pretty steep um, asking price for the film, uh, didn't get it, and they eventually got you know New World, uh, giving us Godzilla 1985. As I mentioned at the top, um, there's been conflicting accounts sometimes from the exact same source over the years as to what some of their intentions were, especially with the political content. But, you know, one thing that has been consistent is that their goal was to, uh, their thoughts were that the original Japanese version was just, you know, too talky and too leisurely for a modern American audience that was more accustomed to rampant action pictures and science fiction pictures that were much more kinetic. And they thought their their idea should be like, okay, have Godzilla appear quicker in the movie, Mm -hmm. tighten the pacing, and then along the way there came the idea of bringing Raymond Burr back. There are some flaws with Godzilla 1985, but it, as its own uh, product, I think it's very interesting. And I'm kind of sad that mm-hmm. we don't have a DVD version that features both the Japanese and the American versions of the film. Mm-hmm. Although, what exactly is the copyright issue behind 85? As my understanding of it, and I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not as familiar with 85 as I am with 84 in terms of behind the scenes stuff but mm-hmm. i do think it's because of the additional music that they use in the film they use some stock music from uh christopher young's score for the film defcon 4 no oh, yeah that boring little post-apocalyptic <laughs> nothing <laughs> and i believe it's because of that music that they have not that there's, that there's been a, this legal tie-up i could be wrong about that but that's that's my understanding of it okay so you don't know anything you don't know about the behind the scenes behind godzilla 85 for all i know I know from what little I've read from the books and whatnot, and of course, I think everybody and their mother knows about the insanity with the Dr. Pepper tie-in. So, mm. <laughs> it, it's like, yeah, it's like infi- like the one infamous story where Dr. Pepper tried to get uh, Raymond Burr to be drinking Dr. Pepper on screen, mm-hmm. and the directors and the producers tried to talk to Raymond Burr, but Raymond Burr just gave him a cold look, and that was the end mm-hmm. of that. Granted, as as dumb as the whole Dr. Pepper thing, I'm happy it gave us those silly commercials. <laughs> because I, I adore the fact that we have a commercial where a bonnet-wearing, triceratops-headed Godzilla girlfriend named Newzilla just shows up out of nowhere. And it's like, oh, we gotta give her the even crappier-tasting version of Dr. Pepper <laughs> to appease her. <laughs> and Raymond Burr, absolutely 100%, from what I understand, did take it very, very seriously. Um, to mm-hmm. the point where he actually rewrote his own ending speech that much i know for a fact because the uh the speech in the script that he was given he did have an ending speech but it was quite different from the one that we actually see in the film yeah he's not he's honestly like let me take a crack at rewriting this you know yeah, it's and- kind of like what robert shaw did with uh his indianapolis speech for jaws mm. you know he, he said okay it's kind of interesting but let me take a let me let me try uh, reworking it a little bit yeah and that's so- how we got the wonderful great speech he gives at the end of the 85 version which i think is and I'll, I'll say this, like, I think it's one of the finer moments of any version of any Godzilla film is that great monologue he gives at the end of the film talking about, like, you know, man's arrogance, you know, and Godzilla, you know, will we, have, will we ever see him again or not? But his, what he's taught us still remains with us. Oh, yeah. And that wonderful, know, wonderful line he says, like, Godzilla, that terrible but strangely, mm-hmm. tragically innocent monster. It's like, yeah, yeah, Ray, like Raymond Burr's rewritten narration it says more about Godzilla as a character overall than I think many of the movies have 
it just mm-hmm. you know in in their own dialogue yeah so yes and it is it's like whatever you think about godzilla 85 it definitely ends on a high note with that narration some of the editing decisions are actually really effective I do love how they, the introduction of Super X is much more effective in the American cut than it is in the Japanese version. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, it just shows up on screen. It's Granted, we're told about the Super X beforehand, but it just pops up on screen, and then that's it. Whereas the American version has that really great long-distance shots of that light in the distance, mm-hmm. and then the music builds up, and then, boom, Super X. Yes. Here comes your hero. It's, yeah, definitely much more heroic... Um, Heroic fanfare, both visually mm-hmm. and music-wise. Um, would you like to see a version, like a, a home media release in the future, that would include the uh, a cleaned-up version of 85 alongside the original Return of Godzilla? Oh, yeah, I see absolutely no reason why not to. I mean, you know, it's part it's part of the franchise and part of the franchise's history, you know, whether you mm-hmm. like it or not. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it absolutely is unfortunate that, you know, we don't have a legitimate release of the 85 version. And again, to lose the Raymond Burr speech at the very end, which I do fully agree with you is one of the best things that come out of this whole franchise, regardless of Japanese or otherwise. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there you go. So let's let's pour out some Dr. Pepper for the 85 cut and hope that one day we'll see an official release. <laughs> We're pretty much coming to the close here. I can't think of anything else. But I, I will say this. I was intrigued when you mentioned they were thinking of doing a direct sequel to this one in 85. Um, was it just a basic concept? Do we know any more about the story ideas behind it? Uh, well, the notion was uh, because you know, the 84 film, we might as well talk about how the film was received when it came out in Japan. Yes, let's talk, yeah, let's talk about the aftermath. Toho had very high hopes for the film, and it did do very well, all things considered. Again, this was the first Godzilla film to be made and marketed for a total mainstream audience in Japan mm-hmm. since Destroy All Monsters. Mm. So a long time has passed, and for the most part, Toho was quite successful. I mean, the film sold 800,000 tickets on its opening night alone. Mm-hmm. And it ultimately ultimately made 1.7 billion yen at the box office, along with getting a huge amount of merchandise that sold. And in terms of attendance, it was the second highest attended Japanese feature in the 84-85 movie year. The only film that beat it was Konichikawa's remake of his film, The Burmese Harp. Mm. Also, keep in mind the fact that when the film comes out in December of 84, that's also the time that Japan movie theaters are having Ghostbusters and Gremlins. Oh, yeah. And, I hate and Ghostbusters, as you, as you recall, was the, the number one worldwide hit of 84. Yeah, it's such a big... It was a movie so big that it makes a small cameo in this one. <laughs> it does, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all those things taken into account, Godzilla 84 did very, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, Toho had hoped that it would do a little better. Their goal right. for the film was 2 billion yen. So, again, 1.7 billion yen. It fell a little short of what they were hoping for. Yeah. Again, it was absolutely not a, a failure by any remote stretch of the imagination. It was quite successful. But they wanted it to do even better than it did. So they did a lot of audience research on the film. And they discovered that most of their most of their audiences consisted of college students and elementary age kids and who giant point, sea louses <laughs> <laughs> who at this point have been reared on you know fast-paced kinetic hollywood films like star wars and whatnot and mm-hmm. indiana jones etc and so forth and who would later flock in droves to see films like aliens and so toho took note of this and they thought well hey you know apparently the modern audience is more interested in fast-paced kinetic hollywood style entertainment Mm-hmm. And for that reason, they, they wanted to seek out a much younger director who was more closer to that generation and had that same kind of taste himself. And that's where they sought out Kazuki Omori, who would direct Godzilla vs. Biollante. Mm. And so they got him on board, and they, were do- and they had their, uh, their famous uh, story contest in 1985 to gather ideas from various places. Uh, Omori was shown the, the five top stories. He combined various elements of different stories to create, you know, the basic concept of like you know Violante, uh, the character of Mickey Saegusa. He injected his own ideas and whatnot. Mm-hmm. However, as it became very quickly early on that Toho was not so eager to make a Godzilla film because they were more interested in having Omori direct, as I mentioned before. Uh, teen idol films. These are films that star very popular singers that mm-hmm. have 
huge dedicated fan base that are much less expensive, no mm -hmm. special effects. And so they're much more financially viable. And even if they don't perform as well, it's never a, it's not a big loss either way. Right. So, and they thought it was more important to have their hot new director work on films like that as opposed to a Godzilla film, let alone a sequel to a Godzilla film, which had, again had done very well, but not as well as they had hoped it would do. Mm -hmm. So that's why they kept drawing it out for so long because you know their their priorities was to have Omori make other kinds of films, and Violante was ultimately greenlit very very suddenly. It was greenlit. Normally these films are greenlit in January of the year they're going to be released, mm -hmm. or if not December of the previous year. Mm. Violante got the green light in summer of '89, so it wow. was a total rush job. You know, there's a there's a lot to talk about with Bialante. Maybe that could be like a, a follow up to this. Oh uh, yeah, podcast. no, no. If I love Bialante, and to tell to tell me it had an even shorter span of creation than most other Godzilla mm -hmm. movies surprises me because the end result is pretty good in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but um, no. If we were to do Bialante, I definitely would get more people on board because that movie. It, it it it's already beloved, but it needs more love. Koji Hashimoto, yes, and Nakano doing the effects along with the the story writer uh, Nakahara. Nakahara. Yeah. yeah, it's I'm kind of sad we don't we didn't get like another Godzilla movie with these three guys working on it. I think they they delivered a really strong Godzilla movie, and I would have liked to have seen them do at least a second follow up. Even though Return of Godzilla does mark the start of what's called the Heisei series, and even though it's oftentimes lumped in with those later films as a Heisei movie, mm -hmm. it's technically a Showa film because it was made when, the, when uh, Hirohito was still the emperor. And therefore, I think it's appropriate that it has you know, special effects by Nakano. Mm -hmm. It is directed by Koji Hashimoto, who was, as I mentioned before, an assistant director to Honda in the 60s, who actually got the job by Honda's recommendation, as a matter of fact. Yes, yeah, and he um, does he does a very good job too. And it's like I'm surprised at the list of credits of all the assistant directors. He was all the way up there and um, started with King Kong versus Godzilla as such. Mm -hmm. He was, yes, yes, and uh, yeah, you know, and he had, did a very fantastic job. The film has you know great atmosphere. It's mm -hmm. got a great tone and feel to it. You know, he's very good at building tension in the film. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, the guy had a, the guy I think had real great director chops, in spite of the fact that he only made two movies. Yeah, what was and, the other uh, other movie he made? The other bit film he made is a not so good film, but a very nice to look at film called Sayonara Jupiter. Oh, I have that in my collection. I've yet to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's very nice to look at, but the story is not is not so good. Not, that probably not, explains why all the trailers are like, "Look at these cool models we got." What story? <laughs> There's no story. <laughs> He didn't uh, pursue a directing career, but I think it was also a wise choice on his part because, you know, as an assistant director, you were a salaried employee mm -hmm. and you had the option of direct of directing two movies and keep your and keep your salary position. If you wanted to direct a third film, you would have to resign from Toho and be rehired as a contract employee. Oh, therefore, you would run the risk of not being rehired some year. And so Hashimoto had already made his two movies. If he wanted to make a third film, he'd have to quit and take a huge career risk. Yeah, and, that, that's some corporate skullduggery going on there. So, and that might, and he might have made the right choice because look what happened to uh, his some of his successors like Okawara and Yamashita, who worked on the films in the nineties. Mm -hmm. You know, they 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 made three films, had to resign and whatnot. And once Toho was said they were, once Toho felt they had. You know they were they'd gotten enough out of them. They never worked again on anything. You know Okawara yeah. never made anything after Godzilla 2000. Yamashita never made anything after Space Godzilla. Mm -hmm. So maybe ha Hashimoto by giving up that and moving into the producer position, which he did do, and getting a much more secure position, in the company that was a good career move for him. Yeah, no, you know, as much, as, much as he might have liked to have made other films. Um, yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. Like you know, even Yosuke Natsuki, who played Hayashida, said that he wished that Hashimoto had made more films. I would have liked to have seen him make, like, say, a, a political thriller or something like that, because... Oh, yeah. Anyways, going back to what we were talking about, like, you no, know, he was very much connected to the Showa films, and as was Nakano, and so on and so forth. And so, therefore, I think it's kind of appropriate that, you know, they kind of, uh, in a strange way, bowed out from Godzilla with this film. And when Bialante comes along, Bialante is literally and figuratively a Heisei film, because it, it's made when the Heisei era has begun. Mm -hmm. And you've got a total change in the uh, creative talent with, you know, Omori, who's a total outsider from Toho, Kawakita, who's a, who's a much 
who brings a new aesthetic to the special effects with Violante. So I think it's kind of fitting that, you know, 84 is in a sense, you know, even though it's, again, the predecessor to the films that follow, Mm -hmm. it is aesthetically much more in common with the films that came before it than the films that came after it. So it's a very effective sort of final hurrah for the show, for the Showa era Godzilla films in a lot of respect. Continuity wise, it is the beginning of the so-called Heisei era. Tying back to what I said originally, it feels like a combination of like the end of the the disaster film epics of Toho's mm-hmm. late seventies, but also in going back to uh, going uh, circling around and going back to the kaiju films that spawned it in the first place. And what sorry. do you think about the uh, the musical score of this film? That's yeah, we almost for- totally forgot about the musical score done by what's oh. He has a cool name. <laughs> Reijiro Koroku. Reijiro Koroku. Yeah, that, that that's that's a roller coaster awesome name. <laughs> Whom we actually did have as in his first English language interview as a guest for Kaiju Masterclass 2 in 2021. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. It, yeah, um def uh, um plug that video, my friend. You were a part of it. <laughs> yeah, so um I'm part of the organizational team for an online convention turned YouTube channel called Kaiju Masterclass, which is basically a, a series of videos, uh panels and interviews that do a deep dive into the makings of the films that we love. These these uh, Japanese special effects films as well as the uh, American offshoots of them. Yeah, and so we've at, interviewed people like uh, Shusuke Kaneko, Shinji Higuchi, Michiro Oshima, David Arnold, uh, William Stout, and various other people. And in 2021, we got what is believed to be the first English language interview with Reijiro Koroku, who scored The Return of Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a he was a fantastic, fantastic interview. I wasn't uh, interviewing him myself, but I was behind the scenes watching it as it as it happened. He was a absolutely charming very delightful and he's and he has a very decent command of english and what made it kind of fun was that he was oftentimes peppering his answers with little english words and phrases which made the interview really <laughs> fun and relatable so uh no it was a it was a very good interview and it was fun to hear him talk about you know working on this you know very ex- ex- work on this truly extraordinary score that a lot of people consider to be one of the best godzilla scores certainly one of the best scores that ifuka bay himself did not compose no offense to Akira Kafube. Akira Kafube is awesome. He will always be like the granddaddy of Godzilla music. But I think like um, Rajiru and also Oshima, both of them, their Godzilla themes, like like Akira Kafube is the iconic Godzilla theme, but if you wanted like their musical themes for Godzilla and the music in their various films makes you feel like, oh yeah, if you saw Godzilla in real life, that that's the emotion that would come out of it. Mm-hmm. And I especially love just, like, like they say that the right musical score can elevate a movie from whatever status the production was to mm-hmm. whatever emotion it can give. And um, Kuroku's score for this movie makes it feel way more cinematic than any Godzilla movie has any right to be. I have similar feelings towards some of the Millennium movies. Like, the Millennium movies were definitely done on a much smaller budget than the Heisei-era films. But the musical scores definitely picks up the slack. And I feel that this is already a very strong film production and visual wise. Mm -hmm. But Kuroku's uh, score just elevates it to almost Hollywood levels of awesomeness. Yes. It's like the the Super X uh, theme alone is just, it just, it just pumps you up. It's like, that's the, if we were superheroes, Patrick, I want that to be our theme music. (laughs) As we fly to the convention to stop the evil uh, car enthusiasts talking about Ultra 7 in a horrible way. (laughs) Yep, uh, the score was uh, conducted by the at the uh, Tokyo Symphony Orchestra, so a very mm-hmm. large orchestra. Yes, you can and, feel it. Yeah. Yeah, and we should definitely also know this was the first Godzilla film to be released in Dolby Stereo. Mm-hmm. Oh, and, okay. Uh, Would that explain why it also sounds so freaking awesome? Yeah, that's <laughs> really true. You know, that's probably plays a factor into why the film as a whole sounds so good. Like you know, not just like you know. The score and like the explosions, but like you know, Godzilla's roar is really amped up. They have a lot of surround sounds and the uh, mm-hmm. the city scenes, like you know, sirens and whatnot. Played with a, a good uh, surround system. This is a very immersive film to enjoy, just on on a pure audio level. And, yeah, uh, even even the eighty five cut of the movie never really affected the music that much, despite yeah. adding music to the score. And I'm glad they kept it in because it is a really good score. 
Yeah, it's 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 it's, it sounds wonderful. The there's so many different emotions. There's themes of terror. There's themes of romance. There's themes of you know feeling a sense of relief. Mm -hmm. There's themes of themes of sadness, like at the ending. Uh, It's a it's absolutely overall one of the the best Godzilla scores in my honest opinion, and one that I constantly revisit. Oh yeah, definitely. And also, it's one of those rare scores that not only matches what's going on on screen, but can still hold on its own as its own music yeah. to listen to like you know it's again i love biolante but one can make the argument the music in that one is pretty weak mm-hmm. um and i'm not just saying that because of you know th- the things we found out with the composer later on <laughs> <laughs> oopsie doopsie there, there's a story in and of itself yeah there's a story yeah so but no no and i'm, I'm happy to know that uh, uh rio jiro rijiro kuroku damn that's a cool name um, is an awesome person in real life too, so it just makes the score even all the more sweeter. So, mm. you know, it's funny. I do remember watching your the watching the um, Kaiju Masterclass interview, but now I'm going to go revisit it and see what else he has to say. But yeah, I can't believe we almost uh, skipped the, skipped the music because yeah, the music is definitely one of the strengths of this. There's a lot of great things about this movie. Now thinking about it, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's it's amazing how it's it was almost firing on all cylinders and even the few flaws the movie has you know are relatively forgivable and even the suspect american version has a lot of really great things going for Mm -hmm. it would you say this was definitely a godzilla movie made at the right time in the right place yes absolutely um yeah this is a this is a film that you know has a reason to exist beyond just you know bringing godzilla back they had a very large budget which they show all the way through the whole thing, not just in terms of the special effects, like like the art direction for the human scenes is fantastic. You know, the sets are big and gigantic. Mm-hmm. There's lots of layers to them. The lighting is fantastic. You know, it's just a, a very great looking movie. You can you can see all the resources that were poured into the film on screen from start to finish. It's a very lavish film. It's got an interesting story to it. It's got a lot of interesting ideas that it dramatizes, which is which is key to telling a good story. You know, fantastic score. You know, it's just a overall a very good, solid monster film, and uh, yeah, like I said, you know, one that I hold in very high regard and consider one of my favorites. Yes, yes, and it is, it is a Godzilla movie. You know, I think I will say it. It's definitely. I've always been such a huge fan of the Showa era, and it's like now that I can safely say that this is very much a Showa Godzilla film, the epilogue to all the great films that came beforehand. But yeah, this is definitely one of those Godzilla movies I revisit quite often. And it's a shame it doesn't play on television anymore. Although even growing up as a kid, it was a rare a rarity to have Godzilla 85 play on television. And I really do kind of I really do wish we got a return to these like darker but not ridiculously nihilistic uh giant monster movies. Movies that are grimly epic, I think is the best mm-hmm. way to describe it. So, as opposed to something that's just overly overly fun and lighthearted, despite a dark veneer like the legendary Godzilla films, or something that's like way too depressing and dark that you just it's just what's the point? So yeah, Return of Godzilla definitely. Well, it's not. It's currently not really available, is it? Or is it the only Kraken releasing that's still relatively cheap to find if you can find it? Um. Well, I do know that. Uh... I, th- I think it's safe to. I think uh, this film is now in Janice Films' hands because I know that a couple of years ago, or I think it was, yeah, I think it was two years ago, um, the film did have a limited theatrical release in some in some places. It was not mm. you know, it was not totally widespread. But I do know that it was playing in some cities, and from what I understand, uh, it had the Janice Films logo before the film, so not so they appear to have the rights to the film now, and it sounds like they gave it like a, a full new set of uh, subtitles and that the film looked very nice uh mm-hmm. so this gives me hope that you know perhaps we'll get like a a criterion release of uh this movie at some point as i as i, as I understand the same was also true for uh, Bialante. so yes you know it's i'm not looking forward to like a big criterion box set of the heisei films even though i know that would make a lot of other um collectors mm-hmm. mouths water but as individual releases of both the of both this and Bialante, i would be totally up for it and mm-hmm. hopefully by then, Criterion may, or Janus Films may find some way to get around the copyright issues with 85, and we can properly have both of those films on the same DVD set. Mm-hmm. So, But that's just wishful thinking, and also... Oh, hey, much- you know, they, uh, they did manage to accomplish what 
I thought and what many thought was the impossible, which was they got us the uh, the Japanese version of King Kong versus Godzilla. That is her, true. Uh, the, granted, it was that very last minute uh, circumstance. It was a last minute thing. That's that's why it's a a bonus feature on the bonus feature disc and yes. not part of the actual presentation. So. Yeah, I, I can imagine just before they started sealing up the disc, it's like we just got the copyrights, mm-hmm. and they just throw a big box of like the original Japanese version, King Kong versus Godzilla, and it just all fell into the product at the last second. So. But it came at the last second, which which is probably an indicator of how difficult it was to get it. But hey, you know what? They got it. I never mm-hmm. thought it would happen. I yeah, never thought it was going to happen. But hey, you know what? They managed to pull it off. So yeah, yeah, more can power, happen. Yeah, more power to them. And also, yeah, if they take their time, I know that Janus Films is infamous. Like they announce they have a title, and then like maybe like twenty years later, we finally get the DVD. <laughs> um, Grant, okay, realistically, six years later. But, <laughs> um, but but at the same time, it would be nice that if they do take their time and care with this, and we do eventually see Return of Godzilla and possibly by Alante as Criterion releases individually, or even if I wouldn't even mind it as like a, a double feature bill, as long as it doesn't, yeah. they don't do so, you know, sacrificing whatever extras or bells and whistles they can add to it. Okay. So, but no, Patrick, uh, anything you want to plug on your end, uh, before we call it quits? Uh, sure. So, um, you can read my content at, uh, places like, you know, sci-fi.com, toekingdom.com, our culture, mag.com, offscreen.com, uh, I have a couple articles and issues four and six of John Lee May's The Lost Films fanzine. I am part of the organizational team for Kaiju Masterclass, which is free to watch on YouTube. Um, you can also uh, read my book called uh, Ruan Ling Yu, Her Life and Career. It's a biography on a great Chinese silent film actress who was active in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s, who unfortunately died by her own hand at the age of 24. Uh, my book chronicles uh, her short life, covers the events of her life, covers her career, also covers the uh, history of her industry, and also political events in China. All, the, all these things uh, kind of come together into what I think is a very compelling story. Uh, you can find my book in both uh, Kindle and paperback on Amazon.com. So. And also has a piece of artwork by uh, you. Yeah, there, yeah, there's that that giant <laughs> It's, oh my goodness. Yeah, it's like, I got nothing impressive to say other than that. Welcome to my YouTube channel and I do artwork. Boom. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can check out my, my links at the bottom, but I'm terrible at shilling. Even if I don't ha- even if I had things to shill, I'm terrible at shilling. So. <laughs> but no, Patrick, thank you very much for joining us on, for joining me on this somewhat serious, straight-faced uh, podcast based on uh, Return of Godzilla. And um, this is going to be the the better companion piece to a likely comedy commentary I'll do with uh, who knows who I'll rope into that one. So. <laughs> okay, so now since since this is the end, I think there's only one way we should end this. And so, Patrick, will you gigantify with me, Power Ranger style, and we'll both leap into Mount Mihara where we'll sleep for another five years until we eventually have to fight our half rosebush sister only if we have the star sisters saying goodbye now godzilla <laughs> goodbye now godzilla our old friend <laughs> that's the music that plays while the little pngs of you and me are jumping to the volcano <laughs> <laughs> Nature has a way sometimes of reminding man of just how small he is. 
especially in the face of our thirst, for a delicious beverage. She occasionally throws up the terrible offsprings of our dull taste buds to remind us how puny we really are without the sweet, filling taste of Dr. Pepper. The reckless thirst of man is often dwarfed by the dangerous consequences. For now, Raph and Patrick, those strangely innocent and tragic goofballs, have gone to Earth. Whether they return or not, or are never again seen by human eyes, I'm just waiting for the check to clear.